Picking up where we left off from about two or three weeks ago, FGCC reads comments and answers questions. Uncommon Sense AUS from Australia says keep up the good work. Brother, thank you very much, and I appreciate that you're still here with us. Up to Crom. Thank you, Thomas. I think verse 7 could also be interpreted as the lion being our bestial nature, that the human that eats the lion conquers his bestial nature. Lion that eats the human being being the opposite. Just my two cents. Thank you. This is excellent. Thank you, Crom. I agree. Those verses uh, of the Gospel of Thomas can be interpreted many, many different ways, and it's always nice to hear what the Spirit is leading you to understand as you're reading the verses. Uh, David Stanley says, Crom, your two cents are right on, but some people do not believe that we have this bestial nature that we must consume, even though the entire canonical text Bible warns us that we do. Thank you, David. Indeed, being part of the canoma, we are obviously carnal in nature. We're uh, the tripart tractate makes it clear that th we're three parts, a flesh body, a soul body, and then, of course, a spiritual body. And this flesh body requires that we, in fact, have have a bestial nature. Part of our work is to tame that beast in the tarot card, I think of the strength card, where the human must tame the lion. So that's such a great interpretation, Crom, and thank you, David, for chiming in. Patrick Lucas says, thank you for breaking down the book of Thomas. Great work. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you for being with us. Keep up the great work. Continue to encourage me here on Common Sense AUS. Thank you again. And Dory S. says, thanks, Thomas. I'm happy to see these showing up so close together. Appreciate that, Dory, and I'm actually going to attempt to release each of the books in a series and have them back to back over the course of a couple of days apart and then probably have a couple of weeks a week or a couple of weeks break so that uh, we have time to marinate in what's been said and I also have time to read people's comments and then make a response video such as I'm doing here. So thank you Dory. And the unorthodox Ecclesia says do you remember the analogy of the pantry? Yes I do that analogy often in reference to the aeons and that'll be brought up another video coming up later. Essentially, that analogy an Orthodox Ecclesia is referring to is when I talk about the nature of God being made up of many, many different aeons, and that we have access to those aeons, and then we take part in a certain type of uh, attribute, that uh, aeon is present with us. So, for example, let's say the aeon of wisdom is Sophia. When we are acting out wisdom, then the, uh, the essence of Sophia, the aeon, is working through us. But the analogy of the pantry essentially is, within life we are constantly creating or emanating whatever we are brought here to do, and each one of us in very different ways, myriad different ways, countless different ways, but we're taking part in the various tools or attributes of God to create whatever recipe we're trying to create. And we have access to the aeons. They are, I give an analogy of a pantry uh, of all these different spices. And we reach in and we select the different spices to make up uh, whatever meal that we're attempting to create. Aeons bring out the essence of what you really taste from the meal, really, essentially, what you're enjoying from the meal, the spices, about three years ago. So, so very much appreciate that you're still here and that you remember that. Peter Odin says, thank you, Thomas, for presenting one of my favorite books. You're welcome. And that's also one of my favorite books in the Nag Hammadi. Then uh, Doria says, I'm wondering why you singled out the very last statement made by Jesus about the unpardonable sin, but didn't include the whole story to keep it in context. Just tell us himself what the sin is. Dory's referring to when I was talking about what what is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? I go on to describe that my understanding from the Bible and the Gnostic text that that unforgivable sin, the Holy Spirit is the pure first thought from the Father, Mother, and you are of that essence because within that first thought, all of the emanation came about, including you and everybody. And so to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to go against that first initial thought, the Father, Mother seated in everything, including you. So when you are not carrying out or someone is preventing you from carrying out the blossoming forth of your seed, fullness of who you are, then that's the unforgivable sin. Uh, I did stop in that particular, stopped it at verse 21. Dory is pointing 
pointing out that uh, why not continue to verse 22 when it talks about the story of when they then brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb. And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, The fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Now notice already, there's a couple things going on here. First off, possession is something that is perhaps the most egregious sin that uh, you can commit. Because when you are possessing something, or possessing, uh, in this case, we're talking about spiritual possession, you are literally taking away the free will of that individual, and you are uh, exercising your will onto them. Again, that's this whole idea of blasphemy uh, that's being illustrated here. So Christ was uh, essentially not uh, necessarily having compassion on this one individual because he could have gone about and cast out all kinds of demons that were everywhere in all these different humans that were being possessed. But he chose this one particular one to illustrate, just this one, to illustrate what is that thing called blasphemy? It is to possess other people. It is to control other people, essentially, away from who they really are. You're trying to manipulate them to be someone they're not, or you're trying to prevent them from being their natural self. So this is what's being illustrated here in verse 22. In 25, it even illustrates it further when he says, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. So when you are not whole in your intention, is essentially what Christ is saying, in every city or every house divided against itself shall not stand. You will not succeed. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? 27. If I be, by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? So in other words, Christ is saying, if I am literally supporting this idea of seek you the truth and you shall be set free, in other words, seek out what makes you free, you will have found truth, then how can me casting out what's possessing this individual and keeping them from their free will be therefore indication that I am Satan? I work in favor of the true father because the true father is of the essence of free will. So that's what he's saying here from my understanding. And 28, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first Bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He's just essentially saying, why would you work against yourself? He's releasing this individual from being bound uh, from this strong man. And then that therefore illustrates he's working in the house of God with this individual. 30, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Again, illustrating that the Christ is within you. Illustrating that spirit was possessing this individual, they were possessing the Christ. And so, 30, one, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto you, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. So thank Dory encouraging me to provide it here, and so thank you for that as well, to complete this thought. And I did, I agree with you, prematurely cut it off, essentially because I felt like what I had said in the previous video about this, as you show here, video 5 of Gospel Thomas, the only unforgivable sin, I felt that, that I had said enough enough to illustrate that, but I think like you, if I had continued all the way through 31, that would have become even more so abundantly clear. So 31, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, everything but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. 32, and whoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is within all of us, so when they speak against you, for you to be who you naturally were meant to be from the beginning, then they are blasphemy me against you. It shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, he shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So even if they were to um, speak against the Son of God, that can be forgiven. But to go against what God seated in every one of us, individually, unique to each one of us, that is the only unforgivable sin. The Pharisee said to Jesus, was casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. So Jesus said unto them that this sin that that won't be forgiven. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is to accuse him of casting out demons with the power of demons. Now, this is your interpretation, Dory, and I appreciate you sharing this. However, I do not agree with this interpretation, and that's perfectly fine. We don't have to agree on every occasion. 
Uh, I think I illustrated very clearly that it was about being possessed. It was about being divided. Christ said very clearly it was about being divided, that that was the unforgivable sin. What you're saying here, Pharisees were the ones that believed that that was the sin that was not forgivable, not the Christ. That's why they accused him and said that he was he was blaspheming. In my opinion, is you're confusing what Christ said with the Pharisees wanted to project onto Christ to make him look like he was sinning by casting out a demon and casting out demons with the power of demons. This is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, who is the true power of casting out demons, healing all manner of diseases. Christ uh, sent his disciples out to cast out demons. He even said that these things I do, you can do in greater and encourage us to do that. So it's within us to heal and cast out demons. That is not sinful at all, much less blasphemous. But of course, again, you are free to understand uh, the way you feel led to understand. Uh, thank you, Dory, for encouraging me to, to continue f uh, the fullness of that particular chapter. Peter Oldis says, Thank you, Thomas. I have previously found the Gospel of Thomas challenging to meditate on. I have often overlooked it. I believe now is a good time to relook at this Gospel. Amen to that. And you say here, Sometimes I feel like a child reading a book for the first time, not understanding much at first, then suddenly a light will turn on. I absolutely know that feeling. Zura Harlow says, May I please have the link to where you're reading this from? Okay. It is the Gospel of Thomas, and the link, uh, you can go to the Gnostic Library. Just type in the Gnostic Library. Uh, it will provide you a link to that site, and on that site, they will have the Nag Hammadi Library. List it alphabetically, and you'll be able to see the Gospel of Thomas. Okay, thank you, Zira, for being with us, and thank you for commenting there, the White Bull. On the New Confessor, 4 and 20 Mystery, much love, and back to you, and I'm glad you're with us. And I may be saying this incorrectly, but I see Benegving Archive, all fraudulent. And thank you for sharing your opinion. Uncommon Sense AUS, keep up the good work. Thank you for your encouragement. And then going on, uh, Mama MD says, I believe these are the parents we are to abandon. And quote, For this cause, therefore, have I in this manner brought the mysteries into this world, which undo all the bonds of the counterfeiting spirit and all the seals which are bound to the soul, those which make the soul free and free it from its parents, the rulers, and make it into refined light and lead it up into the kingdom of the Father, the first issue, the first mystery, forever. Thank you, Mama, for sharing this. This is excellent. I have not touched upon the Pista Sophia yet, but this is a, a very enigmatic book, and these sayings, I think, do show what I said in the video about the powers and principalities, video 10 of Gospel Thomas sayings, where it talks about what you're suggesting here. The bondage is we are bound through our earth parents. I like that you're sharing this and that it is to be refined through the light to return back to the spiritual father and mother. And that's part of the great mystery. For this cause, therefore, I have said unto you aforetime, he who doth not abandon father and mother and come and follow after me. And this is a software way of saying, you know, who that doesn't hate their father and mother. It's another way of saying abandon. I think that's a much more likely accurate understanding of what Christ was saying at the time. I have therefore said at the time, ye are to abandon your parents, the rulers, that I may make your sons of the first mystery forever. Unquote. Pista Sophia, chapter 131. Thank you, Mama MD, and thank you for being with us and sharing such a deep saying out of the Pista Sophia in relation to that statement about Christ saying, you know, if you don't hate your father, you abandon your mother and father, then you can't follow me. Dory S. says, it's the archons, the rulers and principalities whom we should abandon. Those are parents in this world, spiritually speaking, who come to the true father through Jesus Christ. Yes, so there's the father-mother that's lowercase that's being referred to, and then there are uh, the spiritual father and mother, which are uh, the profundity and barbello, which make up the monad. So those are capitalized letters, and so either one of these interpretations, and I would say both, actually, are w the way I understand it, because ultimately it is having to abandon your mother and father and everything that they've taught you for you to find your path. You're not going to completely agree with everything they taught you along the way. You'll be able to take some with you, but also what Dory is suggesting on a more spiritual level, that we look to the authoritarian figures known as the archons of the demiurge, but our growth, spiritual growth pathway that Christ set forth is to become independent even from that. So thank you both for sharing your understanding of when Christ talked about banning your father and mother or hating your father and mother in order to follow him. 
Horse Reddish Roots says, I'm so glad you're back. You can't imagine. Thank you so much. And thank you, Horse Reddish Root. I'm also glad that you're still with us. And you said thank you much. And again, thank you. Antonio Lowe says, wow, love it. And that is from Gospel of Thomas, video 7. What is the cause of all suffering? And Chrome says, this whole book is very union. Yes, absolutely is. And Peter Odin says, thank you. And I really appreciate when you guys have gratitude to the work that I'm doing here because it does encourage me because it helps me to see you guys are taking value from what I share. Doria says, Jesus called the Samaritan woman a dog too in the canonical gospels. What meaning did it have in that setting? This is an excellent question. When Christ talked about dogs, what he often talk about is people that are hungry for the truth, but they typically don't see themselves worthy of the truth, and therefore they seek it out in people that don't treat them well. And so Christ wasn't looking at the Samaritan woman as a dog, but he was using the analogy as she was a dog seeking out truth. Because the analogy that's given in the, the gospel that Christ would often talk about is a dog that's eating crumbs and, and scraps from the master. And because that's how they saw themselves, they would see themselves as no more worthy than a dog that is just simply eating from the master's table. They wouldn't see themselves any better than that. And that's what you have. She was very humble. Her whole nature, when you read that verse about the Samaritan woman, you come to see her whole personality that uh, she couldn't even believe the Christ was before her. She wanted to worship. She didn't feel worthwhile. So Christ spoke to her and reminded her how she saw herself, not the way Christ saw, saw her, but rather reminding her of the way she saw him, herself. That's the way I understand it. Now, I'm very uh, open to others sharing their understanding of that verse, but that's uh, the way I understand. Oh, because when Christ talks what appears sometimes condescending or talking down to people, if you read further into it, you will see everything is an analogy often. Not everything, but much of what he says is an analogy to what's going on around him at the time. He's not necessarily talking directly about them, but he's talking them in context to something else, a bigger message. Thank you for such a great question, Dory. Uh, Horse Reddish Root says, thank you. Again, thank you. Peter Ode says, thank you, Thomas. And again, thank you. You say, brilliant, thank you. Again, that's from the secret book of, of John. And then uh, Lomax says, this is so good. Thanks. How'd you figure all this out? Did you have some teachers? Thank you um, for saying that, but no, um, I would say that for my own personal journey, when I was little, I would say about age eight or nine was when I first read the Bible all the way through. I always felt that there was something missing about it. And I would continue to read it. And by 13, I read it for the second time. And I felt like at that time, I, I began to get more and more understanding. And then by the time I was around 20, 21, I read it for a third time all the way through. For a time after that, um, I actually joined a evangelical movement and uh, I was going into seminary and considering becoming a priest. And then eventually there were many things that I felt were not in alignment with the way I understand the, the Christ and the message because I had read it three times and it still seemed like generally the interpretation seemed to be at that time from the church at that point seemed to be often focused on sin and looking at other people's sin. The whole saying about Christ and why do you judge a the needle in your your brother's eye when you don't even pay attention to the log in your own eye. So that's all I can say because I would say from there I just kept praying and praying and praying that God give me knowledge. When I picked up the Nagamati, everything just sort of flooded in. All the questions that I held for years and years and years, they began to almost like um, these pockets that were lacking water and water just came flooding in. It just filled it up and it was just became, everything became so clear to me. And I'm saying I know everything and I've got all the answers at this point, but it was that moment that I felt led to share that. And I don't really have an answer. I can only say that I'm just sharing my understanding. And I encourage everybody to also um, read for themselves and discover for themselves. They may agree or disagree with what I'm having to offer here. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's anything necessarily special, but I appreciate you saying that. I think it's more that I'm one of the first to step out and do this. And my hope is others will do so. And I can think of a few people that I'd love to see do that that are on the site that's following us here. So thank you, Lomak, for your, your humbling question. 
Lomak then follows up with uh, thanks so much for the series. Amazingly well done. Thank you, Lomak, again. And thank you for being with us, uh, if I haven't said so already. And Lomak says, I wonder where our free will is. I've wanted to lead this reality for more than a decade, but I cannot. So where is this free will? I'm sure many feel the same as I. Thanks for your great videos, by the way. Thank you, Lomak. And this is such a profoundly deep question, but I will make a, an attempt to answer my understanding uh, about where is our free will. So free will is wherever your truth is. Uh, remember when Christ said, Seek ye the truth, and you shall be set free. So whatever your truth is, that is where your free will is. That is where you will find your liberty. Now, free will, uh, like everything in the Kanoma, this realm that we live in, comes with a cost. Recall that simultaneously, while you have a free will, you are also part of the Father, Mother. So you also have seated within you uh, what David Stanley, uh, one of the, our listeners here who often comments, and I really enjoy his comments, and I miss some of his comments. Uh, I haven't seen any in this this video, but he challenges often that we don't necessarily have free will, but instead we have what's called fate. And I agree with that. I think that we are, in fact, a paradox. We are fated, while at the same time we have free will. I often give the analogy of a maze where we all walk into a maze, we will all come out on the other side of the maze. None of us have a decision or choice in having been put into the maze in the first place, nor do we have a choice exactly where the doorway is on the other side of the maze. But what we do have is we have a choice about, think of the maze as having an infinite number of different pathways. They all lead to a door specifically assigned to you. The front doorway is specifically assigned to you, and the doorway at the end of it is also specifically assigned to you. That's fate. So why am I bringing that up in relation to free will? Will you talk about here, I've wanted to lead this reality for more than a decade, but I cannot. It's interesting that you make a very affirmative statement, very, very affirmative, I cannot, because I think there's a couple of things going on. You recognize something. You recognize there's something valuable about your life, despite the ridiculousness of this round, the suffering, promise of death, pain, and all the bloodshed, and all the madness, right? Despite all of that, you still find something worth or salvaging. And that something is the seed in you. That's your name. And the reason, and you're asking me, I'm telling you, and I'm, I'm speaking with a very commanding way of answering, is again, keeping in mind this is just what I believe and what I understand, and how I'm answering your, your question here. You understand. See, the seed within you is your name. The Father Mother gave you before you even came into this realm, which you are to seed into this, the damp soil, the dark realm, just as the seed is put in the dark dirt. We're in this dirt. We're in this muck. And we're in the dark, groping in the dark, trying to find our way out. That seed is a certain accomplishment that you bring with you into this realm. But that is merely a seed. So your goal is to cultivate that seed and to grow that seed into a tall tree and grow many fruit. That's what Christ gives that anal analogy and the tree of life, so forth and so on. So when you get a sense of completion uh, about that goal, or you tire out, perhaps you'll tire out, and you'll know you'll tire out if you start drifting completely away from what you are here to do. And you'll know what you're here to do when you are doing it, and it gives you a sense of feeling not in bondage to something. But it seems so right to you and it brings you joy, and it brings you peace. Now, not to say that the that the doing of it isn't difficult, or won't have challenges or obstacles, and you will maybe have to pay a price for it, just as Christ says, going to the cross. You bear that seed, you see. That is the cross that you bear each day. You must bear each day, and you must pick up and like it may be your thing is to be an Olympian, for example. That is not just something you can just wish. It has to be something you have to work for. You have to have faith in. Faith without works is empty. That is perhaps why, Lomak, that you feel you have not completed what God brought you here to do. But also I would argue that you recognize that the light that is within you is the most valuable thing you could ever have been given. So is isn't something you would just rob yourself of, right? That is the most valuable thing the Father gave you, that free will, exercising the free will, that is the light. And so I, I don't know you, but I'm presuming based on the way you write here, it seems to me that you're the type of person that you try to live an excellent life and you uh, have gratitude for whatever you've been given. And therefore you don't just simply, you know, put the light out, if you will, but you make use of it and you try to bring as much light as you can to the world. And that's why I would say, now, 
It may appear to you, again, like you're saying, but I cannot, but the reality is you can. Even in the cannot, there's a can in it, because that's a choice. You're choosing to not do it. Now, I would, of course, not encourage you to do that. I'm sure that you will not do that either, because you've said you cannot. So that is a choice, even though it may not seem so. That's the sort of the paradox of it. But nonetheless, in the end, I'm saying that the free will part of it is your desire to continue to live to fulfill the promise of the seed, which is the faded part. That faded part will result in it coming forth, if not in this lifetime, then maybe in the next or several hundreds of lifetimes ahead. Because see, it is something that was seeded from the father mother from the beginning. And whatever the father mother seeds, it will result because there's nothing the father mother wills into being that is imperfect. I don't know if that answers your question, Lomak, but such a wonderful question. I, you're just new to the channel here, I can see, but I can already see you, you have some very deep thoughts and excellent commentary here. So thank you. DG Liberty says, so are you saying that the only way out of here is through suffering and self-sacrifice because it denotes an understanding of the fallacious nature of this reality and our absolute lack of attachment for this world. I'm not saying that you have to suffer or you have to sacrifice and that that's what the Father Mother requires of you in order to leave the Kanoma to get to the, to the Pleroma. That's absolutely not what the Father Mother requires of you. It is that the Demiurge brought that about because they want to control, they want to possess. And this brings us full circle back to what Dory was talking about when she talked about the only unforgivable sin, which is possession. That possession is what is resulting in the controlling nature, uh, want to have power over others that brings about the suffering. But the self-sacrifice is a choice by you. The thing is, it's not required by the father and mother, but you choosing to be part of this realm. You are part of the Christ, you see. You're also part of the Sophia. And remember, Christ came to complete the work Sophia did. The beginning of that is wisdom, which her work was to introduce the idea of being separated from the father so that she could experience the father and mother independent of the father and mother, and the Christ to complete that by bringing a pathway back to the father and mother so Sophia and the Christ would return. That would show the way, the truth, the light back for every myriad of millions of spirits and souls. But it is that this realm requires suffering, and it is this realm that requires self-sacrifice. It is not something the Father Mother requires. And if you have wisdom and you have gnosis, that in fact will help you reduce the odds that you will have suffering and have to create what you call self-sacrifice. I would argue that when you aren't following what's truly in your nature, you're literally sacrificing yourself. In fact, you are doing the opposite of sacrificing yourself when you're following your true nature. Whatever that name is that you were brought here to do, that's when you're being liberated from suffering, being liberated for self-control. But if you are thinking you can avoid suffering altogether in this realm, then no. Again, remember that that doesn't therefore mean that something the father and mother requires of you, but it's the nature of this realm. That's what Thomas says in the Gospel of Thomas. When you realize the truth, you come to understand that this realm is not worthy of you, for it's but a carcass. Thank you, DJ Liberty. And the Dory asks, what exactly is Gnostic definition of the ego? This is a great question, Dory. I wouldn't necessarily say Gnostics have a definition of it, but I do understand what you mean. Uh, what is the ego? How would Gnostics maybe understand the ego? You're getting in very union and and it makes sense. Gnosticism is very union. But we have to remember, you know, what does Carl Jung say about the ego, the superego, and the id? The ego is, you could think of it as being Pluto in astrology, being Leo. Oftentimes, most people will ascribe Leo to the ego. It's the purposeful part of the person. And the Gnosticism of the ego would be sort of like that headstrong individual that feels a will to generate uh, whatever it is they're intending to generate. I'm going to go to the Latin term because the Latin term literally means I. When Christ says, I am that I am, that's what Moses had said. And then Christ says, you say I am, what you, who you say I am. I is the most powerful thing you could say. In this world, we've often been told ego is a bad thing. But without the ego, the super ego and the id would take over. The I would be subsumed. The thing is that the balance between the ego and the id is what you want. I essentially is, I, I can't answer for all Gnostics, but just my understanding of the ego being essentially when we become guarded or defensive about self. Think of it as a tool. It's neither good or bad. It is an 
why it is merely the vehicle what does it mean to be yourself what is our identity how do we see ourselves that is the ego you know when we often think of ego because of the way it's been taught through psychology and gotten into mainstream thought as being sort of a bad thing ego actually is not neither good or bad but it merely is how you perceive yourself what is the way that you understand is your pathway to whatever it is you're trying to generate or whatever you're trying to create or emanate what can get into a problem is when people feel threatened and they get defensive about their identity or their self-image or the way they perceive themselves to be. Maybe a new introduction of a thought comes and they have to rethink the way the world is or the way they thought the world is and that rubs them the wrong way and they get become very prideful. Pride is something they're guarding their emotions. They would, they're trying not to get hurt. Uh, they're trying to believe that they can sustain their old system of belief, even though they're being introduced to something more persuasive or something more healthy or better for them. We often think of the the, the diseased part, uh, ego representing some, something mentally ill. But again, I try to encourage people to think of the in Gnosticism, I would say the soul really would be sort of the ego. We have a sensitivity to the way we see ourselves in our mind's eye and how we protect that version of ourselves. And it's neither good or bad because sometimes preserving the ego can be helpful healthy healthy practices and then there are some unhealthy practices that preserving the ego would not probably serve us so i don't know if that answers your question again i can't answer for all Gnostics, but I do understand the nature of the way you're asking this, and at least the way I understand it, Gnostics would probably argue, in my opinion, uh, the way I understand it, sort of the psyche, uh, or that second part of the human. Remember, there's three parts of the human, the material uh, and the psychic part, which is the uh, mental, emotional part, rather, and then the spiritual part. I would think of it, to me, it's most close to the, the soul nature uh, of the three tripartite uh, human being. Again, uh, wonderful question, Dory. Thank you. And that does it for now, but I will be going back, Dory, because I know you asked a couple of questions prior to this series on the Gospel of Thomas, and I didn't want to skip out on that, so I will be making another video going back on a conversation between you and David Stanley. I think is worthwhile reading on, commenting, and answering on. Uh, so we'll get to that in the next video, and then following that, we'll pick up on our next book in the series of the Nagamadi Library. And until next time, stay at peace.